Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here today to talk about what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus in Nebraska. As always, we're going to start with our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy. Again, even as we start loosening up restrictions, and today some restrictions are loosening in places like Lancaster County here, we want people to continue to remind, remember these six rules. These rules have not gone away just because we're loosening restrictions. So the first is, again, stay home. Don't make any unnecessary trips outside the household. Second rule, we want you to work. Work from home if you can. And we solicit employers' helps in doing this. If you're going into the workplace, continue to remember our social distancing guidelines, the six feet from each other, 10-person rule, all that sort of thing. So continue to socially distance at work. Three, shop, but shop once a week. Go by yourself. Don't take the whole family. And be efficient. Have a list. Get into the store. Get out of the store. Those would all be good uh, things to do following shopping. Number four, help kids socially distance. Keep them at home to play. Avoid group sports and playgrounds. So all good things to do to help kids. Number five, help seniors socially distance. You can do that by running errands for them, maybe doing their shopping for them so they can stay home. But do not go visit them in a long-term care facility because we are trying to keep those folks isolated. So please keep that separate. So those are our rules. Again, remind people to keep Nebraska healthy, continue to follow these. Even when we're, as we're doing uh, loosening restrictions, we're going to continue to do social distancing for the foreseeable future. And these are our six rules for helping to keep Nebraska healthy. All right. So um, one of the things we talk about is the hospital data. Uh, we have 47% of our hospital beds are available, 43% of our ICU uh, beds available, and 76% of our ventilators available. So again, lots of capacity in the hospital system. And that's what this is all about was when we talked about, again, a couple months ago when we started all this, flattening the curve is lowering that peak, the peak of when people are getting sick and going to the hospital, because we know of all the people who get sick, a certain percentage are going to go to the hospital, so that you lower that peak, peak, you spread it out, slow it down to make sure that you don't overwhelm the healthcare system. That's what this has all been about, all these restrictions we put in place. It has worked. It's been successful. We have not overwhelmed our healthcare system anywhere. Even in hotspots like Grand Island, we've been able to manage it in a way so that everybody who's been ha who is needed has had access to that ventilator. So that's what it means to flatten the curve. It means flattening it down. So you, you take that peak down and that you, keep, you make sure that you preserve your healthcare system by doing that. This is a virus. You cannot stop it from coming. Nobody has any immunity to it, so it's still coming, but you can slow it down by the restrictions we put in place. That's what we've done, and the hospital numbers that we put out show that we've got that capacity in the hospital system. Test Nebraska reminder. Okay, so testnebraska.com. Please go sign up. Uh, we want people to sign up. We've got about 135,000 people who have signed up. We want to get people to sign up so that they can go do the testing, and that's how we're going to tackle how we're slowing the spread of virus here in Nebraska. It's one way that every Nebraskan can participate. It, the test takes less than five minutes to fill out. It's a simple assessment. It's kept in a secure database, not sold to anybody, not given to law enforcement, will only be used for this testing. It's also how we're going to schedule people for testing. So if you want to see testing in your local area, please sign up for testnebraska.com. Now, we've rolled out teams so far for testnebraska.com, our mobile teams in Omaha and in Lincoln and in Grand Island and today starting, in, uh, starting today in Skyler. So far, we've received back 2,358 test results from last week and 80 people have tested positive. And again, remember, we're prioritizing people who, uh, at least uh, last week, we're prioritizing people who are People protecting us, healthcare workers, first responders, that sort of thing, you know, police, firefighters, and then uh, highly symptomatic people, and then less symptomatic people. Starting on Friday, we started allowing people who are 65 or older to also be a part of that. Oh, and I also forgot food processing was also a part of it. In the food processing industry, you're also prioritized. Starting on Friday, we started sending out emails allowing for people who are 65 or older to also be prioritized as a part of that. Now, here's the good news. We had lots of people who were interested. But it also did fill up all the slots in places like Lincoln and Omaha. So there were not slots available for everybody who wanted to sign up. That also bogged down the system a little bit and that people tried to call into the hotline 
and the hotline did not have enough uh, staff to be able to handle all those calls. So just ask Nebraskans patience as we go through this process and as we're rolling out testnebraska.com and trying to expand it, please be patient with us. You'll follow up, you'll get, you'll get follow up emails with regard to how to get signed up and everything like that. So uh, please continue to be patient with us. We know that some people had difficulty in signing up for those slots because the slots filled up quickly, uh, especially in Lincoln and Omaha and that the hotline uh, wasn't answering calls the way they should. So please be patient with us. Uh, DHM updates. So we uh, don't have our map here to show you, but uh, there are three. Uh, so on Friday afternoon, um, we had a conversation with um, our Elkhorn Logan Valley Public Health District, and we put out a press release on Friday that they would be loosening some of the restrictions in line with what has gone on in the other counties. Uh, to, uh, you know, for example, allow hospitals to go to 50% capacity, 15 kid, kids in daycare, uh, allowing salons and barbershops, tattoo parlors, and massage therapy, therapy to open under the 10-person rule, all those standard things we've already done, that that would happen in that public health district starting on Wednesday, the, May 13th. And then today we're announcing in three other health districts, Public Health Solutions, South Heartland, and Two Rivers, that they are gonna be loosening restrictions starting May 18th. So those are, to give you just kind of an idea of where those public health districts are, Public Health Solutions uh, is an area around Crete, Saline County, so just to give you kind of an idea where that is, uh, that tends to be where most of the cases there are. Two Rivers is Lexington, Dawson County, that area around there. So, and then um, uh, South Heartland is Hastings in the area uh, there south of Grand Island. So. Um, you'll have kind of an idea of geographically where those are, and they will start loosening restrictions on May 18th. We uh, had conversations with them on Friday as well. We talked about the data with regard to the hospital availability, what's, you know, all the things going on with regard to their cases and so forth. If you, if you look at the data with regard to it, uh, we feel very comfortable with regard to loosening the restrictions in those public health departments. So again, those three will also be uh, loosening their public health or the, loosening the restrictions on public health, but again, in a very measured way that we've done across the state and other places. Okay, tomorrow's election day. So if you haven't already mailed in your ballot, if you, or dropped it off your county, and you're planning on going to the polls, the polls will be open tomorrow. So we want you to know that there's gonna be PPE kits for all the poll workers out there and everything, so, uh, you know, They'll have, they'll have masks and gloves and so forth, and best practice will be have a new pen for you and everything. Uh, also today, I signed an executive order 2023 that will waive some of the statutes that will allow for people who are not a part of that county to be able to volunteer to help out, to make sure the, the polls have staff. Uh, specifically around eight counties, we wanna make sure that we've got proper staffing for. So this is gonna be Dakota, Dawson, Douglas, Hall, Lincoln, Lancaster, Madison, and Scotts Bluff counties. So those counties in particular, we will have um, National Guard who have volunteered to be able to help out with these polling places. They will not be in charge. This will be somebody from the county there that will be in charge of everything, but they'll be able to help out if there's a need to. If, they don't, if they're not needed, then they obviously won't be deployed. They'll be, not be in uniform, so they'll be just in you know, regular whatever the polling workers uh, are gonna be wearing kind of thing. So, uh, but they'll be available to help out in those eight counties if necessary, should uh, that be required. So, uh, somebody asked on Friday about the availability of using National Guard. So, we do have the National Guard available to be able to help out tomorrow if it's needed for those eight counties. And uh, we're making plans to do that with the Secretary of State. So, again, tomorrow, election. And again, we've held elections through pandemics, we've held elections through wars. I think it's important that we make sure that anybody who wants to go to the polls is not disenfranchised, and that's why we've been working so hard to be able to keep these polls open. I know the Secretary of State and his team have been working very, very hard with the election commissioners to be able to make this all happen. So I wanna thank them for all their hard work. All right, so another thing that we've been getting a lot of questions on has been with regard to sports. And so I know the commissioner has been asked about sports. You may recall when we put the DHM in place for May that we have schools operating without students till May 31st and that we cancel all extracurricular activities through May. Now, we have put out guidance that if you are a private coach that sells memberships or something like that and you want to 
coach people specifically, you can. Some people have taken that, oh, I can put get together my team and, and do a practice or something. No, that's not true. There are no team organized practices or games in the month of May. So we've covered that a couple of times, but I want to just make sure everybody's clear, there's none. However, we are putting out guidance now with regard to specifically baseball and softball for the month of June, some guidance on how practice and games can begin. So starting June 1st, we will allow team organized practices with lots of restrictions on social distancing to begin and games to begin June 18th. So, and this will just be again for baseball and softball, no other sports. Now again, if you're a tennis player, you can go out and play tennis, that's fine. Uh, tennis doubles is fine too, right? Those were things that were never specifically closed. But when we're talking about those team organized sports, we're starting with baseball and softball. June 1st, practices will be allowed. June 18th, games will be allowed. Lots of restrictions on how this is going to work. So go see our guidance document on this. Guidance document's been handed out here to the local press. But again, it's the same sort of thing you can imagine, right? That players need to use their own bats, gloves, helmets to the extent possible. That for practice, when parents show up, they can drop the players off, but then they got to get back in the car. Uh, players need to be spread out, and coaches got to work on this for during practice, make sure they're doing that six foot distancing. Players need to bring their own drinks, their own snacks. Uh, during games, um, you have to spread out. Again, bleachers will not be used for fans, they'll be used for the players. Fans will be limited during games to only household members, and they have to bring their own chairs or stand during the games, and again, be six foot distance from everybody else. So again, lots of um, guidelines with regard to how to do that social distancing. And we really want to, again, step into this slowly so that we can see how this works. Uh, some other questions may be, why are you picking baseball and softball? Well, those are sports that are generally more socially distanced anyway. And we want to take this a step at a time to see how we can roll this out and, and make it work. And along those lines, then, I've invited uh, Commissioner Bloomstead to come back as well to talk about, he, he made the announcement last week with regard to Launch Nebraska, which is the uh, resource, basically the how to start planning on opening up schools and, uh, you know, kind of that step-by-step -step process to be able to do that. And so I'm going to have the commissioner come in and talk a little bit more about uh, Launch Nebraska and then just summer school and things like that. So, Commissioner, why don't you please come up and talk to us a little about that. Yeah, thanks, Governor. And uh, the reality, obviously, for us is we start down this path of starting to look uh, for ways to explore what's safe and what works for for team sports and for practices and and ultimately. So the the efforts that are taking place for baseball and softball, we expect to be able to learn from, learn on certain protocols and practices that are going to be important to keep. Uh, uh, keep the spread of the virus at a minimum and be able to uh, engage in a meaningful way. Uh, I think the other part of this is we've had a lot of interest from schools. Schools are used for facilities for a lot of different types of activities and they're getting asked a lot of these questions. So right now, just fo so folks understand, it's baseball and softball is what we're talking about. But there is, I think, a provision coming to start to look at the use of other facilities for schools. And I want to be able to use Launch Nebraska and work with our school officials across the state so as soon as possible after June 1st, we actually have protocols in place that would be able to identify what the proper and appropriate use of school facilities are. We'd be able to look at, you know, what are the, the protocols that might be coming together around other types of activities and sports, but not, not least of which is also to think about uh, services for students in a summer school environment as well. And so what folks have to understand is we're really learning from each small moment that does is not small when you're de designing certain protocols baseball and softball is actually complex when you think about the environments but we're learning things to think about right the not sharing snacks not sharing drinks being thoughtful about those things using your own equipment are all parts of the the learning process that we can use for other for other sports and other activities i think constantly as we go through this process working with school officials and talking about what really is going to make a difference and how they can make decisions is what our purpose is for launch Nebraska really are, that we really think about how, how we have to do that thoughtful leadership and planning and pull elements of that together, how we can think about the, the conditions for learning, really
really what the environments look like and be beginning to make protocols that are appropriate for each one of those environments. Really moving us down this path ultimately to talk about things like summer school, um, you know, what the continuity of learning is. What are, our, what are the interactions that might take place between students and, and teachers and how do you contain that into the small groupings that might be appropriate. And continuing that dialogue as we go, learning about that ultimately will help us to re-enter into the fall semester and think about what school may look like and what are those safe protocols. So it's really important that we take each moment and understand that we're, we're, we're using baseball and softball around sports. We're using other opportunities to learn about what's really best. Um, using these types of DHM orders coming forward to, to provide further guidance, to be able to keep building on that and kind of have kind of a, what I'll call a common sense approach. Once we start to do something here and we believe it's at a, uh, a safe impact, we can kind of model that for other types of, other types of activities. I'll be working with, our, I have a, an advisory group of our superintendents. I'll meet with them on, on Wednesday where I have about 24 superintendents, several different groups, including the, the Nebraska School Activities Association and Jay Bell are trying to work together on what this looks Looks like. Given the fact that we're talking about June 1st as a time frame, it allows us to start to put some of those practices and, and, and further details in place using the protocols that are established within Launch Nebraska. And so we'll continue to do that and build on that. There's national conversations happening as well. So it's not just Nebraska. We're learning from other places that are doing this and doing this successfully as well. We're continually looking at what those best practices may be that are healthy and safe for, for students, but ultimately for the population at large and I think that's going to be a critical part of our ongoing efforts. And so I appreciate the chance to, to be here for the moment and talk a little bit about how we continue to build those protocols in a safe way, continue to appreciate the partnership with, uh, with the governor and, and his team to make sure that we can continue to, to, to move forward as a state, find ways that we can do that, and ultimately, from Nebraska's perspective, make sure that we can move forward um, in, a, in a process that's logical and smart and based on, on informing local decisions about what's best. And so that's what we're doing with Launch Nebraska, and I appreciate the governor continuing to, to uh, provide some guidance and direction so we can learn from that and move forward together. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, also, in addition to the guidance documents that we're doing on sports starting for uh, June 1st on, for baseball and softball, we also have published the guidance documents for uh, body art, for our barbershops and salons, and for massage therapy. So those are now also, those guidance documents are also the, out there on the DHHS website, dhhs.ne.gov slash coronavirus. That's where you can find these gu guidance documents. So again, I know that folks in, for example, the salon industry were very interested in having those guidance documents. Those are now posted out there on our website as of today. Uh, corrections PPE, we'd gotten a question last week about Corrections, and I just wanted to reinforce that what Corrections is doing is following CDC guidelines with regard to use of equipment. Specifically, this is about using N95 masks for you know, everybody in the facility, and that's not what CDC guidance calls for. CDC, uh, so the cloth masks that we're using in uh, many of those situations is absolutely appropriate. N95s for specific instances, we're using N95s for those specific instances, but again, uh, we don't need to be using up N95 masks in ways that are not called for by the CDC guidelines in our correction system. We want to make sure we're using that equipment appropriately per those CDC guidelines. So just wanted to follow up and clarify on that. And then also we have received a number of questions with regard to testing uh, in our corrections facility. And just want to uh, uh, reiterate that we have had eight of our teammates test positive. Uh, we have now tested three inmates who uh, had close contact with one of our teammates, and Director Frakes made the decision based upon what he thought was a prudent call with regard to the close contact those three inmates have had. Uh, all three have tested negative, and they are all quarantining, but I just wanted to bring everybody up to date with regard to where we are with the Department of Corrections and testing on that. And then schedule for this week, we've got English briefings at 2 o'clock Central Time, and unless the President calls a some, some sort of conference call, in which case then we'll try and move around his schedule. But other than that, we'll be at 2 o'clock Central Time, just like we are here right now. Spanish briefings at 5 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays Central Time. And then I'll be on NET again this week as well, 8.30 and 9.30. Dennis Kellogg, speaking of Nebraska show on NET. All right, so let's go ahead and get to some questions and answers. 
Martha Stoddard, Omaha World Herald, AARP Nebraska wants long-term care facilities with coronavirus cases, either in residents or staff, to be named. Other states are naming the facilities, even posting the information on the web. Why is Nebraska not naming these facilities, given that people are having to decide where to put their family members or whether to leave family members in a facility? So again, I just our policy at the state of Nebraska is only to release aggregate data with regard to these facilities. With regard specifically to long-term care facilities, when uh, a resident tests positive, the facility is made aware of that because then that person obviously has to be isolated and treated differently. The family is also not notified when that when somebody is tested positive. And if you're looking to um, place somebody in that facility, I would add, or if you're looking if you're a family if you're looking to place a family member or a loved one in a facility, I would certainly ask them with regard to the facility, if they have anybody testing positive there. So um, that, that, so again, and again, if you're a local public health department, we, we have not prohibited anybody from talking about in this, uh, the, you know, specific information with regard to a facility. But our guidance has been, if you're a local public health department, you ha and you're going, you're going to talk about if somebody working there has tested positive, you need to verify that with the employer again. Um, the employer needs to, verify the person actually works there because sometimes we've had people not tell the truth. So um, again, if you're a local public health department, you, you can release this information, but you've got to verify again that they actually have, um, that they actually work there. Grant Schulte, Associated Press. How many people have been tested so far through Test Nebraska? That was that 2,358 tests we've received back. Have you had any problems at this point? And I think I mentioned, covered that already with regard to when we opened it up to 65 or older, we had a lot of people who had an interest. The slots filled up quickly. There were some issues with regard to people being able to schedule that through the email. And then also um, a lot of calls were generated to the, the hotline. And so not all those calls were uh, answered. So again, we were working through getting additional staff for the hotline and so forth. So we are working through those issues. But again, please be patient as we get people scheduled for this. Do you have any idea why Douglas County cases have surged and suppressed Hall County? Uh, I and that's also from Grant. I would uh, refer you to Dr. Adi Poor. My understanding is about 36% of the cases in Douglas County are related back to food processing facilities. I suspect that's probably one of the causes for more cases in Douglas County, but I would certainly refer you to her to get the specifics. So um, she's going to have a better grasp and be the... Uh, source you want to go to for that. Rob McCartney, KETV. Uh, let's see. The governor is still asking people who visit certain parts, is the governor still asking people who visit certain parts of the state to self-quarantine when they return to Nebraska? And if so, which states and for how long does he recommend self-quarantine last? So again, uh, we still have the guidance out there that if you're like a snowbird and you're coming up here, uh, coming back from Florida, Arizona, for example, and you're coming back to Nebraska that you quarantine for two weeks, if you are say visiting your lake house here in Nebraska, same deal if you're coming from out of state, quarantine for two weeks. Certainly if you're traveling internationally, you're coming here, we want you to quarantine for two weeks. Does not apply necessarily to like that truck driver who regularly crosses the border. Doesn't apply to people who commute, uh, you know, whether you're in Council Bluffs in Omaha or South Sioux City in Sioux City or Cheyenne in Scotts Bluff or whatever it would be. Again, those are different types of situations. But again, if generally you're coming from someplace that has got community spread, we would want you to come back here and quarantine for two weeks. David Kelly, KTCH. Um, let's see, let's see. There's no data on um, the number of hospitalizations and the number of recoveries. Our local, uh, local health department apparently, uh, their local health department staff with only three people tells us they don't have the manpower to assemble those statistics. If manpower is an issue, why not use some of the uh, federal aid to assist the state health department workers if they are needed. And absolutely that is available out there for our local public health departments, as you know. It also is just a, a matter of priorities on bringing people in, getting people hired, getting them onboarded, um, if you, especially if you are in the moment dealing with a number of the other things the health departments are doing. It's sometimes challenging to get all these things done at once. Certainly agree that the more that we can talk about, say, the number of people recovered, that's a good thing. I know Dr. Poor is tracking that in Douglas County, for example, with regard to the number of people. We're publishing the, the hospital data, uh, you know, as far as the overall state aggregate for hospitals, uh, beds available, and so forth out there as well. And, um, you know, again, just 
I would say just be patient with the local health departments as they are, we're all kind of learning our way through this. Uh, certainly the resources out, are out there for them to staff up. However, I would say that things like contact tracing are gonna be a higher priority to be able to get done because that directly impacts how we can slow the spread of virus here in our state. And so with that, we've, we, uh, Taylor, where'd you go? Oh, Taylor, uh, questions? So the question from WWT is, uh, am I satisfied with the number of tests we've, we've been able to complete so far? And is this investment worth it? And the answer is yes on both cases. Again, we did our soft launch la last year, or last week rather. As we start ramping this up, we've launched four of our mobile testing teams. So we're, uh, we're gonna be having future announcements about additional testing teams. We're in four locations now doing testing and we expect to be able to get up over the course of the next several weeks to be able to get up to 3,000 additional tests per day on top of the roughly 1,500 tests per day that we're doing through our public health lab and UNMC and CHI and the other hospitals and um, the commercial labs and so forth. So uh, this is one of the ways that we're really going to expand testing here in the state. So this is absolutely worth the investment to be able to um, expand that testing and make sure that we can get a good picture on what's going on here in the rest of the state. So um, we're very excited about the progress. We want to continue to make more progress and get up to that 3,000 test a day. Becca from NET and DeLon from KTV both have similar questions about the ACLU. The ACLU has put out a letter or statement asking for the state of Nebraska to regulate meatpacking plants. They make the claim that Nebraska has no plant in Nebraska has fully implemented CDC, OSHA, or UNMC recommendations. And they um, would like to know if you think that the state of Nebraska should regulate meat packing plants. So a couple of reporters asked about ACLU and uh, calling on Nebraska to regulate the food processing industry. That is already covered by federal guidelines where we're talking about CDC and OSHA, and they're responsible for doing the regulation and doing the inspections and so forth. USDA does the inspecting of actually the meat itself, for example. And so that's what the federal government does. What we've been doing is working with them through UNMC to be able to establish the best practices. The, you know, the, the meat processing COVID-19 playbook is, is really that document out there that, it, that it has all the best practices in it. We're doing weekly phone calls with the food processors to be able to talk about these best practices. Also talk to them individually as well. So that's our role here as a state of Nebraska is to work with the facilities to try and keep them open. The federal government's job is to do the regulation. Uh, the, uh, apparently the ACLU in their statement or press release or whatever is saying uh, the facilities are not following OSHA guidelines. That's really OSHA's business to be able to enforce, not the state of Nebraska's. And then finally, Melanie <clears throat> from the New York News Times wants to know what will happen with ball tournaments that are scheduled throughout the summer? So Melanie wants to know uh, from the York News Times what's going to happen with ball tournaments that are scheduled throughout the summer. Again, we're just put out the guidelines with regard to how baseball and softball games can work. So this is starting practices June 1st, games beginning June 18th. And in those guidelines, it talks about if you're going to have more than one team play on the field, that you've got to have them in a separate area. They can't be mixing the players from the game that's coming up to the game that's there currently. You gotta wait till everybody leaves. You're gonna have to sanitize down everything. So uh, organizers of tournaments are gonna have a lot of extra work to be able to make sure that they comply with all those guidelines to make sure that you're not mixing those different groups of people to be able to have that tournament if that's what you're gonna do. So I would suggest start with just trying to make sure that people are following the guidelines with regard to games starting June 18th. And obviously, if you've got something scheduled before June 18th, you're not gonna be able to do it from a uh, team game standpoint. Is that it, Taylor? That's okay, great. Questions from in here? Yeah. Are you recommending uh, everybody wear masks when they go like for a youth sports this summer? Are we recommending everybody wear masks? I think when you're playing sports, it's gonna be difficult to wear masks because, again, just the nature of the physical activity there. But certainly, if you are one of the 
household members that are there. That's not a bad idea whenever you're in public to wear a, a mask. Some cases, again, it's just not going to be practical to wear masks. For example, if you're going to a restaurant, it's not going to be possible, to, not really practical to wear a mask into a restaurant if you're going to be eating there. I think you just got to use the same sort of common sense when it comes to how you use masks in public. If you're playing a sport, it could be very difficult to do that. But if you're going to be one of the spectators, it certainly would be possible to do that. Yeah, Lee. Commissioner, if you don't mind, this yeah, might sure. be more targeted to an NSA member, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, logistically, is it possible to rearrange sports to move more physical sports to the spring and maybe some of those softball, baseball, and keep them in the fall and like shift the football to the spring kind of thing, or is that so is far? That I'm not. Yeah. So the question basically is: Is it possible to move sports seasons around within the year to think about that differently? And so far, we've not had any deep, de detailed conversations about that. I think as we start conversations with NSAA, I'll, I'll find out if there's some more of that. But I think you're probably right. NSAA will have to probably weigh in on that topic. Uh, Senator Kavanaugh, Blood, Kalowski, and Hunt are calling on you to terminate the contract with Test Nebraska, citing what they say is the company's lack of experience with the kind of testing that's being required, and the fact that they say public health entities, uh, including UNMC, were not consulted prior to entering into this contract with them. What's your response to that? So uh, the question was, uh, a number of state senators have said that they don't want testing here in the state, essentially, right? Because that's what they're talking about. <laughs> no, they want test Nebraska in the state uh, because they say that lack of experience and lack of consultation with um, uh, UNMC. So first of all, folks, um, this is new for all of us, right? So you're not going to find a lot of companies that have tons of experience in testing in a pandemic experience since this is the first one we've had in 100 years. So on the face of it, the senator's statement is ludicrous. Um, and again, I just have, can't think that the senators just don't want to have testing here in the state. Why wouldn't you want to have an additional 3,000 tests a day on top of the tests we're doing? That's kind of the whole goal. In fact, UNMC told us that they wanted us to get to 3,000 tests a day, so we went out and figured out a way to do it. So that, and not only 3,000 tests a day, when we get ramped up to 3,000 tests a day in Test Nebraska, we'll have 4,500 tests a day. So that's part of what we want to do to make sure we've got a good ability to test people here in the state of Nebraska so that we can find those people who have tested positive, get them to isolate, do the quarantining for their contacts, you know, do the contact tracing and get those people to, to quarantine so that they're not spreading the virus and they're watching their symptoms and so forth. That's, so, that's just standard epidemiology to be able to you know, control a pandemic. So um, I, I, think it's, I think it's just kind of ludicrous what the senators are asking for. I, I don't understand why they don't want more testing here in the state. We found a way to be able to do it. They should be happy that we're doing more testing. Well, they say if you had offered the $27 million to the local infrastructure that perhaps they could have done it too. So then uh, what uh, Fred's following up with is uh, they're saying that if you'd offered that $27 million to the local infrastructure, they could have done it too. And the answer is that's not true. Uh, we know that, for example, there, there's a reason why we're setting up this lab at St. Elizabeth's CHI here in Lincoln, because neither the public health lab nor UNMC have the space to be able to do it, and they couldn't do it in the short time frame that we were talking about, nor did they have the machines to be able to do it, nor did they have the test kits to be able to do it in the time frame we were talking about. So again, uh, I, the centers just don't understand what this all involves to be able to get something like this pulled together so quickly and to do this many tests. Yeah. So again, there was no ability to be able to do it in the time frame we're talking about. You know, again, you, you had to have access. Again, what we were able to do through um, the Silicon Slope companies was they had, because of their consortium, access to the machines, the PCR machines, and the tests to be able to do this. UNMC, Public Health Lab, nobody had that capacity. So you could not get it done in the time frame we were talking about as quickly as we're, look, we're already up and running. We're doing tests last week, right? So nobody had that ability to be able to do that. And in fact, you know, we used the public health lab to help verify the lab that we set up at CHI to be able to do this testing. 
UNMC offered to be able, you know, offered their resources to help do that too. So it's been a, a collaborative process of getting this up. And I, I, nobody at UNMC has complained to me about this. This is a complaint being manufactured by those senators. So we, we are doing more testing. The senators should be happy we're doing more testing, that we've got that ability starting last week to do more testing. That's a good thing. Was there an option to just buy the equipment and the uh, reagent and the testing kits? So you say, well, that would have been an option, buy the equipment. So the, so the question was, was there an option to buy the equipment and buy the reagents? And, and no, there wasn't. I mean, that's the whole thing. Look. Every state was out there trying to find ways to expand testing, and it still is looking for ways to expand testing. We're still looking for ways to expand testing. And we found a company that, or a consortium of companies, that had access to all these materials to be able to help get this set up very, very quickly. And that was something that was, I mean, I, I don't know of anybody else that was offering to do the same sort of thing to be able to help get it set up so quickly. So. Uh, again, this was, some, this was an opportunity for us to be able to get this testing ramped up. We're demonstrating it already by testing people. The 2,358 test results we got back last week, that's a good thing. We should want more testing. Of course, they were concerned about the accuracy of testing, and it does look like the positive rate is much, much lower with tests in Nebraska than it would be for the other labs. Can you? So, yeah, so the question was about. So the. Yeah, so the question was, what about the accuracy of these tests? Again, we validated our test lab with, you know, again, cooperating with the public health lab to be able to do that. And the, you know, the tests are going to be 95% accurate. And then the other question was, why do you have a 3% um, testing positive rate versus, say, double-digit testing rate with some of the other tests we've been doing? And it gets back to the population we're testing. So, again, what we've done is we've prioritized healthcare workers, first responders, food processors, but they didn't have to ha you didn't have to be symptomatic to be able, to, and to, if you were in that group, you didn't have to be symptomatic to be able to get the test. And now we've expanded to pe extended it to people who are 65 or older. Again, you don't have to be symptomatic to be able to get prioritized to do that, which means if you're testing non-symptomatic people, your, pro your chance of getting people who are testing positive is gonna be lower, right? Versus where we're testing in other places, we're testing in high risk areas where we have hot spots. generally people are symptomatic. So we're testing people who are more likely to be tested positive with some of the other testing we've been doing. But you do ask if they're symptomatic. Can we get a comparison of the positives on the symptomatic people that were tested by Test Nebraska? Yeah. Versus the other, I mean, we're just getting the lump sum now. So the question was, but you also asked for people being symptomatic, and we test those people too. So can we get a breakout between those two? Uh, we'll have to dig into that. that uh, I don't know the answer to that question right offhand, Paul, so we'll have to kind of dig in and kind of figure out what's, uh, if we can pull that, separate that data out. And can you say, um, well, two questions. Why was it expanded to 65 and up? Were you not getting enough people in to get tested? And I, I also noticed on the website, now you're telling people the test will be back in 72 hours, not 48. Has that been a change as well? So uh, a couple things. One, with regard to um, the uh, why did we expand it 65 or older, that was uh, really, again, just to expand the population. So as we have the capacity to expand more people, you know, we found out, for example, not everybody who was scheduling uh, showed up. So we decided we can start expanding the, the population that's being tested. So again, we can maximize the number of people who are going through the process. And then, I'm sorry, Paul, the other question was? Uh, have you also changed the criteria that you'll get test back? Results oh, in 72 hours. so yeah, so the, so the question was, I had set the expectation we wanted to get these things turned around in 48 days. Now we're setting the expectations in 72 hours, or sorry, 48 hours versus 72 hours. And that was actually just based upon, if you look at the mean testing time of all of our testing, it's about three days. So I think, um, I think the mean is 2.7, the median is three, and that's not just Test Nebraska, that's all of our testing. So just to line it up better with everything that we're doing and what we're actually being able to deliver right now, whether it's Test Nebraska or other means, we're setting the expectation of 72 hours. Can you say why it's taking a little bit Well, actually, just so you know, it's not Test Nebraska that's driving that mean, that's all of our other testing too. So that's just in general how long it takes. So my, I wanted to try and get these things turned around in 48 hours, but if you look at all the testing we're doing, we're really doing about three days, so that's what we just set the expectations to be three days. 
it's actually not taking longer, Paul. It's taking three days. That's what I'm saying. I set the expectation at 48 hours, but they said, gee, Governor, it's really taking us three days to get these things done. So we should set the expectation around three days. We have time for a couple more questions. Yeah. The test in Nebraska kind of, the number of people that signed up kind of started off quick, and it seems to have slowed down. You have, isn't it, over half a million tests purchased? Where do you plan on filling that gap? I mean, you can encourage people to sign up to a degree, but you also have over 400,000 tests you still have to accumulate. Right. So the question was, gee, you've got 135,000 people signed up. You've bought 540,000 tests. Seems like you've got lots of extra capacity to be able to do that. We're going to find all these people to take the test. Is that kind of it, right? So uh, again, I think the reminder is we are going to be doing this for the foreseeable future until there's a vaccine. So yes, we want more people to sign up. TestNebraska.com, go sign up, please. It'll, it's a five-minute assessment. We want people to sign up so that we can schedule you to get those, that testing done. So we are going to continue to encourage people to do testing. But also, we're going to be testing people throughout probably the balance of the year. So what we've done is made sure that we've got the supply of you know, access to those testing kits and the materials and all that to be able to actually do that testing. So we're thinking down the road, you know, at least through the rest of the year, until there's a vaccine, the way we're going to be able to tackle this virus is test people, find the positives, get them to isolate, go back and contact trace all the people they've been in touch with the last two weeks, get those people to monitor their symptoms and quarantine, and that's how we attack the virus directly to be able to slow the spread here in Nebraska. So we think that, again, thinking down the road, we're going to be doing this the rest of the year, so we need to have access to be able, those materials to be able to keep doing it. Was there any input in doing a purchase sum now six months down the road, three months down the road, purchase more, or was it when you had gotten to that deal, it had to be a lump sum, we want all the tests purchased? So, so again, the question was, could you just buy some, or did you have to do a lump sum purchase? The uh, deal that they offered us was a deal that we took. So again, they were only able to do that with a selected few states, and um, if we had missed this opportunity, we didn't know when the next opportunity was. So this was, what they, this was the package that those companies were offering, and so we saw that as an opportunity to be able to expand testing here in Nebraska. That, that was the offer. That's what their business model was. That's what they offered us, and that's what we signed the agreement with. Yeah, we've got two more over here. We'll take them. Yeah. I just have a question for the commission. Okay. What was your question, Brandon? Uh, with the election tomorrow and in light of the traveling out of state and needing to quarantine, there's speculation that um, some petition groups might be coming in and being outside polling places. Do you have any guidance or talk about what kind of complications that could cause? Yeah, I would, I would just say if you got people, for, first of all, uh, we'll have to look at putting out some guidance for people who are collecting petitions because, again, this is going to be something like salon work. You're going to have to be within six feet to be able to do that. So uh, I would urge Nebraskans to be cautious about signing any petitions if the person's not being wearing masks, but we'll put out some guidance with regard to that. And I would also encourage those petition people to hire Nebraskans. <laughs> okay, don't get people from out of state, because if they're coming in from out of state, they really ought to be thinking about quarantine, especially if they're going to be here for an extended period of time and circulating. They're going to have to be, they, they really ought to be thinking about quarantining. So quarantine for two weeks. So obviously, if they're coming in from out of state, they're not going to be able to do that for tomorrow's election. So my advice would be get, get Nebraskans. And I'm just concerned about petition circulators circulating the virus. So my advice would be get Nebraskans to do that. Commissioner, can you come and take the other question? Yeah, so just looking at these guidelines with youth sports and how you guys are going to try to do things with baseball and softball, depending on how it goes, Will this factor into like, what schools do come this fall? So the question basically is, depending on how it goes underneath all these protocols with baseball and softball, will that factor into how we determine some things for the fall? And it absolutely will. The, the reality, I think, for us is using every little moment um, to see how coaches interact, how fans interact, how parents, parents work with coaches and their players to make sure there's some safety. I think in each of these cases, it gives us kind of a model that either works or maybe has some challenges with it uh, to be really thoughtful about. Obviously, baseball is different than some of our other fall sports, and so there's going to have to be further conversations about what that might look like, but at least it gives us a start to look at kind of fan behavior and, and parent and coach's behavior as well. Great. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate it. Thank you all again for being here this afternoon to talk about what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus in Nebraska. I want to thank all the Nebraskans who are working very, very hard to slow the spread of the virus. Please sign up for testnebraska.com. That is one way that everybody, everybody in Nebraska can be a part of fighting the virus here in our state. Sign up for testnebraska.com and get uh, signed up so that you can also be scheduled to get that test. 
that's going to be an important way for us to be able to make sure we're really taking on the virus directly to get people to isolate and quarantine so we can let other people start getting back to a more normal life by loosening up some of the restrictions that we've talked about. Thanks again, and we'll see you all again back here at 2 p.m. Central Time tomorrow.